Hello, good afternoon. It's bright. Wow. Uh, there's a lot of people here for a Friday afternoon. This is nice to see. I thought it was going to be the two of us and nine people in front, but this is nice. So I'm Dirk Hondl. I'm VMware's Chief Open Source Officer, and you are? And I'm Linus Torvalds, and uh, I don't like doing public speaking because I get nervous and all stressed out about it. So we've done this thing now for several years where I'm perfectly OK with Q&As. And uh, that takes the stress out. Yeah, and, and speaking of taking the stress out, uh, your, your stressy two weeks are over. Yeah. 419 merch window, how did that go? Uh, yeah, that wasn't so good. Um, the, so as hopefully everybody knows, we've had this uh, release schedule where we have a two-week merch window when all the new code goes in. And then we have six or seven weeks of, of calming down period when we try to find all the bugs in the new code. And that's been going on for a long time. And usually, um, it's not a big deal. I mean, the two weeks of merge window is my busy period. That's when I sit in front of the computer the whole day, especially the first week. And then usually by mid-second week, it's the stragglers. And we're already starting to, to fix bugs. And, and it's busy, but it's not too bad, except the last two weeks. So 4.19, we had several issues, like a new hardware security issue came out in the middle of the merge window that just made it much more stressful than it should be. And uh, maybe it's me, although I talked to Greg earlier today, and it's definitely Greg, too. Uh, but it's. It's particularly stressful when you have a busy season anyway, and then there are all these other things going on at the same time. And we had, we had the security issue. We had a stupid bug that has been around for a while that came, the report came in at the, just the wrong time, too. So, so some merge windows are better than others, and this was not a good one. Yeah, you and I have talked about this many times where you say, uh, the best thing you can say about your job is when it's boring. Yeah. And so when I talked to you about a week and a half ago and you were completely stressed out and clearly not happy, uh, so right now, what are we doing to go back to boring? Well, I think we're over the, the hump now. Um, the merge window for the mainline kernel was actually better off than, than the stable kernels. One of the issues we have is when we've had these hardware security issues, and they've kept happening now the last year. Uh, they're kept under wraps. So we knew about the issue for the last several months. But because it was secret and we were not allowed to talk about it, we couldn't do our usual open development model. Uh, um, and we do the best we can. And People really care deeply about getting a good product out. But when you have to do things in secret and when you can't use all the nice infrastructure for development and for testing that we have for all the usual code, it just is way more painful than it should be. And, and then that just means that, especially when, it then ha when the information becomes public during what is otherwise a busy period anyway, uh, it's, it's just annoying. And, and I have only myself to blame, because if I'd not delayed 4.18, the timing would actually have worked out way better. Uh, but but it, it is what it is. I felt at the time that I really needed to delay another week, the previous release. But so you have alluded to, to the security issue a couple of times now. Um, so what, what do you think right now about speculative execution? I still love speculative execution, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I used to work for a CPU company. Uh, we did it in software back when I worked there. I, I think a CPU has to do speculative execution. Um, it's somewhat sad that then people didn't always think about or didn't always heed the warnings about what can go wrong when you take a few shortcuts in the name of of making it slightly simpler for everybody, because you're going to throw away all that work anyway, so why bother to do it right? And that's when the security, all, every single security problem we've had has been basically of that kind, where, where people knew that, hey, 
this is speculative work. If something goes wrong, we'll throw all the data away. Uh, so we don't need to uh, be as careful as we would otherwise. And uh, I think it was a good lesson for the, for the industry, but it was certainly not a fun lesson for, for us on the OS side where, where we had to do a lot of extra work for, for problems that weren't our problems. It feels somehow unfair. I mean, when we have a security, security bug that was our own fault, it's like, okay, it was us screwing up. It's fair to, that we have to do all the work to, to then fix our own bugs, but it feels slightly less fair when you have to fix somebody else's. But so we, we had the, the first round of them in January, then we had another round in May, and now we had another round in August. So should we check our calendars and not book anything in early November for the next set of bugs? I, I, I don't know what the schedule is, and if I knew, I wouldn't be able to tell you. <laughs> uh, the good news, I mean, the really good news, and I'm serious about this, is that the, the bugs have become clearly um, more and more esoteric. Mm -hmm. So uh, it impacts fewer and fewer cases, and... and Clearly, hardware people are at Intel and other places are now so aware of it that I'm, I'm hoping we're really getting to, to the dregs of the hardware security bugs and, and going forward, we'll have much fewer of them. So, but, but your expectation is that this is not gonna stay with us, that we every three months get a new hardware bug, this will peter out and we'll go back to, you know, the last 20 years before that we had what, two significant hardware bugs that affected the kernel, and now we had seven, eight so far this year. Yeah, we're I, gonna I go back to the good old days. I, I hope so. I, I think we're going to the better days when, when A, we got the bugs fixed, and B, people were thinking about them beforehand, so. We get to do our own bugs again. Good. Yeah. Um, but so one of the things that, that has been discussed a lot in, in the context of why these bugs came to be and, and how they are driven by a von Neumann machine being, you know, pushing at the edges of what the model allows you to do. Um, and so over dinner last night, the conversation came on quantum computing. Is, what, 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 is, what are your thoughts on that? Is that where, the, where our yeah. future will be? Or? Yeah, I'm a huge unbeliever in that whole thing. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't think it will ever happen. And, uh, and if I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure that I'll be long dead by the time people can prove me wrong, so. Uh. Yeah, so, but I mean, Google has now, what, 57 qubits? That was the claim. Yeah, and uh, what, what's the value? What, what, where, where, where's the opportunity? I, I think the value has probably been more in physics and, and playing around with things, and hey, it has been known to happen that, that I've been wrong before. So, so maybe the whole quantum thing is going to be a thing. But I think if you actually look at where hardware is going today, uh, the much more relevant part is that even tradi I mean, traditional computers are not scaling and uh, people really don't see a lot of realistic uh, paths forward to, to go on the hardware side. And I actually think that's probably healthy for the industry eventually, and especially for us software people who have gotten kind of complacent knowing that uh, it, the saying used to be that every two years performance doubles, and that has clearly not been very true lately, and it's not going to be true going forward. And I think that's good. I, well, it may be not fun, but it means that it will maybe go back to the partly to the time where you cared more about performance on a software side and you had to be more careful. Uh, and you can't just rely on hardware getting, getting better all the time. So I already see the headlines that are being typed over here. Linus Torvalds, the plateau is, is, is reached. No more performance improvement in the hardware. Well, I'm not really saying that, but uh, it, it sounded like it. I, I was I, trying to help I do our friends we, in the press. Yeah, it's it's pretty clear that that 
the whole Morris law thing is definitely not something you should take for granted anymore. And it, it does, I mean, this very much impacts the hardware people, but I'm saying it also impacts, I think, us software people, and especially our system people, where, where it, it means that software itself has to be, you know, has to take that into account. I, I think it has a huge impact, because if you look at the bloat and the growth of more and more complex libraries, and if you look at the, the architecture that is increasingly commonly when we had this conversation with, with, uh, with someone earlier, where a, a Hello World program is, is 120 megabytes and it prints Hello World. That's awesome. Um, uh, obviously, something's got to give. And if the computer stopped uh, doubling in performance, then maybe we will need to start writing better software. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that's a somewhat welcome change. But, but one thing that I was, I was going to poke a little more at, and, and since you dissed quantum computing, we'll just have to invent something else real quick here on stage, because the question is, what is the next thing after the, the von Neumann machine? Or is that really the end of the development where we are now? So, I mean, I'm a software person, so asking me about hardware is kind of questionable to begin with. Uh, Which is but, why I do it, yeah. Uh, I'm actually a huge believer in neural networks. Um, at, back way in the days when I was at the university, uh, I was studying artificial intelligence and, and the traditional kind of artificial intelligence and always felt that that was, that was snake oil uh, and that the real model of AI is to actually look at what we know works, right? Uh, and, and I'm really happy to see that this is clearly the direction that the, the industry has been going lately. And neural networks don't need an OS. Mm -hmm. Well, the network itself doesn't need an OS, but part of it is also that they aren't really computers in the traditional sense at all. And I actually think that we'll be in the situation that we'll, we'll have the von Neumann model, the traditional computer model, for when you want to just give the computer commands. And I think we've also known for decades now how operating systems are supposed to look. So that is not going to go away, and that's not really going to change. I mean, the details will change. And then we'll have the neural networks on the side, the same way 10 years ago people were so excited about GPUs. and. Uh, 10 years from now, maybe somebody comes up with a new model, but, but right now it's clearly AI that a lot of the industry is excited about. And, and it's interesting, uh, 30 years ago when you and I were both in college, AI was the big new thing, and now AI is the big new thing, and eventually it, it, it will maybe even be the big new useful thing. Well, eventually it will be just I, <laughs> and at that point we're done. There is that. So. Um, Let's switch gears for a moment. I, I, I talked about us being in university. We both actually did go to college. Um, but if I look at today, if I look at the education system versus the people that I talk to here at these events and, and the people that I see being successful in, in open source, it, does it make sense today to get a college degree, a master's, a PhD, or is, is just being a good developer enough? I wonder where that question is coming from. Um, I actually, I, I enjoyed my college years immensely, and I think they helped a lot too. Uh, at the same time, uh, programming to me, but this may be because of how I got into it, is something you do on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't learn it at university. You do it while you're at university learning other things. Uh, so I don't think it's an either or at all. It's a combination of both. Um, and, and I don't think, I think you're setting the question up for a false di a dichotomy that isn't really there. I, I, I actually wasn't trying to set you up for anything. This was a, a truly curious question because and two of your daughters are in college, the third one is going. I have a few more years before my daughters get there. But to me, this, is, this has something, this has always been something that I was interested in. I know so many fantastic developers who don't have a computer science degree, who have you know, 
not finished high school or are veterinarians or you know, biochemical engineers or uh, business majors or, you know, uh, a great friend of mine has a degree from Juilliard and it's a fantastic development. Uh, so that was my question. How important is that college right. degree as a computer science or a double E major? Um, so I actually think uh, computer science is not like a science in the traditional sense uh, because you can actually be self-taught and in many ways being self-taught is preferable uh, in a way that you don't want your architect or your structural engineer to be self-taught. Right? <laughs> there, is, there is a big difference there somewhere. Uh, so uh, you definitely can drop out of high school still and be a good programmer. And it's not necessarily uh, always a good idea to plan that way, but it, I, I think programming and software engineering is kind of special and not real engineering in that sense. I, I, I would absolutely agree with you that the idea of a self-taught dentist is not one of my favorite no. thoughts right now. But I, I, I want to double down on this a little more because I think this is a really interesting uh, direction to talk about. Um, you said being a software developer is something where you can be self-taught, where experience plays a huge role, where curiosity and, and basically stubbornness, I know the word is perseverance, sorry. That perseverance so much better. Is, is really important. And if I look around, if I look at the, at the core kernel maintainers, if I look at some of the the, the, the better known developers out there, a lot of them aren't CS majors. And that to me was the interesting part where I said, is this a field where it's maybe different, where the focus on you have to have your eight years of, of college to have learned all the basics and know all the Latin words or whatever. Um, is, this an, is this a field that is different and in, in such is maybe more open to to non-traditional entry points. And we had uh, Van Jones talk here about the fact that we have uh, so few um, African Americans um, in, in this field. And obviously, if you look around, I mean, it's kind of hard to see, but there aren't a lot of oh, women in the audience. all look very dark to me because yes. the yes. bright lights. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so to me, the question is, could this be an advantage for our field that you can come in from, from a broad variety of background and experiences and educational paths. I, I see where you're going, and I, don't, I sadly don't actually believe you. Uh, I do think there's a huge advantage to getting a CS degree. Um, I think you may partly be coming from, I mean, I, I, I know a lot of the kernel developers who never had a CS degree, and part of it was purely historical. When, when, we, when we started, uh, not a lot of universities even had a CS degree. So there were a lot of people who came in with physics degrees or came from a math background. And I, I think that's still true, that that's a, a very good way of getting into software engineering is by having a background in your problem space. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you don't want to have a college degree necessarily. It just means that maybe you shouldn't go for CS as your primary. You could go for physics or biochemistry. A lot of biochemistry these days is computational. Uh, and, uh, and you are still going to often want to have at least a four-year degree is my gut feel. That's what I tell my children. <laughs> don't drop out. I, 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 I'm kind of disappointed that you assumed that I, I was going to set you up to say drop out of school. I was, I was actually curious about your thoughts on this subject and, and, and thanks for enlightening me. Um, let's, let's switch gears because this is only going to get worse from here. Um, <laughs> one thing that is interesting to me in as I, as I go over to the exhibit hall and I talk to the community managers for many of the cool open source projects that are over there, and, and Linux and Git and this other project that you do, uh, none of them have community managers. How come? I don't know. Uh, I never even thought about that. Uh, we 
particularly the kernel, is kind of odd. Uh, if you look at open source projects in general, a lot of open source projects are very small. Mm -hmm. They're like a handful of developers. Uh, a lot of them started inside companies, so you actually needed somebody to push the project to not be inside the company. And I think that's where a lot of the community management comes in, is that you, you kind of need to be an evangelist and, and, uh, and push the project out. And the kernel, for some reason, never had that, and yet is one of, like, it, we don't have a handful. We have a handful of thousand of developers, right? And uh, we never had a community because we had several different communities. People still, almost nobody is on the kernel mailing list. Uh, the kernel mailing list, a lot of people consider it to be an archival system, not a discussion system. And most of the development is done on much more targeted mailing lists. So you have one for MM issues, one for specific architectures, things like that. And then you CC the kernel mailing list just to see if somebody does a drive-by comment or so that it's there in the, the archive. Uh, so the kernel in many ways is not a good project to look at if you, if you like, want to look at open source in general because it is so different, not just in technology, but in, in the whole community model. But, and it always has been. But the same is true for all three of your projects. Well, you say three, but let's face it, uh, the Diveblog software community is so small that we don't <laughs> need a community manager. Uh, yeah, I don't know about Git, uh, and I do want, whenever Git comes up in any public situation, I always want to make it clear that yes, I started the project, and yes, I took it to the point where it was useful, but I have not maintained Git for the last, how many, uh, 13 years? Uh, well, Junior Hamana has been a great maintainer, and he deserves all the credit for Git. Uh, and apparently he didn't need to have a community manager either. And I don't know why that has been true of, of Linux and Git, but I do think that part of it is it, they did not come out of uh, a company. So, so then let's turn this around. How should a project attract developers? What is, what is, what is your advice for a project that says, we want to get more community, more developers, more participation? So my advice is actually slightly negative in the sense that if you see the point of your project to be to grow and you, and, and you see your job as being to get more people involved, you're not doing your job, right? As a maintainer of a project, your job it's not to find other developers. Your job is to make sure that the project works as well as it can, and your pro job is to be responsive to the developers you have. And if you do a good job at that, and you make a good job project, it's the if you build it, they will come model of, of motivational speaking, saying you don't, you don't go out and look for developers. You do so well that developers come and look for you. And that's my theory, and uh, I think it does match what we did in the kernel and what Git has done. You, you just said something very interesting. You said you have to be responsive. And this is something that I, I, I had a couple of discussions here in the hallway. I talked to Julia about this in the context of maintainers saying, oh, I can't respond to this thing within two weeks. Yeah. And my response to her was, well, that's a failure of the maintainer. If you maintain a subsystem, a two-week response time is just way too long. It, maybe you need a second maintainer, maybe you need to... Yeah. Yeah. What is your point on that? Yeah, no, I, I, so my, I see my job as being... I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, I do not answer email usually. Uh, um, when you send me a patch, uh, if it's a good patch, I will apply it and push it out. And I generally will do that in a responsive manner, but I will not respond to your patch and say, good email applied normally. 
Uh, but I do think that as a developer, and I've been on the other side too, not just as a manager, but as a developer, when you send out patches, the last thing you want to do is not know where to send them and not know what happened to them once you sent them. Uh, I don't, so as a manager or maintainer of a project, what I think the primary goal would is, is to make sure your developers know whether your patches got accepted and if they didn't, what should happen to them mm. uh, and, uh, and not on a two week notice, more on a, I'm not saying 24 hour notice because nobody's there 24 seven, uh, but I try to keep my response. I tell people, if you don't get a response and you expect one in 48 hours, then resend. That's what I used to just say. Uh, of course, I've also moved up the maintainer chain. So now I don't deal with individual patches very much anymore at all. And if you send me a patch, the real maintainer for that area did a bad job of explaining where you should send the patch. <laughs> uh, so uh, most of the time when it comes to the kernel, uh, we now have two or three levels of maintainership. And that is definitely a way to solve the whole problem with one single person cannot keep track of even a medium-sized project. But, but we can quote you that you think a two-day turnaround time is a reasonable expectation. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's what I do. I, I go away occasionally for, uh, I mean, usually it's diving. Uh, but so I'm, a, I'm not online all the time. But I see my job as being making sure that when my sub maintainer send me a pull request, I, I answer or I usually do the pull within the day. Uh, and that includes weekends. Uh, and the merge window is special and everybody knows that because then I get basically a few hundred pull requests. Well, it's 150 pull requests in two weeks. And then I spread them out and I don't try to do them all on Monday when they come in. <laughs> so, um, but you talk about the fact that you respond on weekends and that you, you drill down into the, the hard problems. And one of the things that I was curious about is what causes you to get sucked into a challenge? And I'll give you an example of something where you didn't get sucked into a challenge. So on the one hand, we have kernel bugs where you get completely monomaniac and just, never mind. Uh, and on the other hand, we have that long ongoing conversation about blurry fish butt. So photography, oh. where there is a challenge where you clearly did not get sucked in and did not try to get to perfection. So what drives that? <clears throat> oh, I actually, I claim that a part of any good driven strategy is knowing what to ignore, right? Uh, it's one of the reasons why we have many, many kernel maintainers is because I was so open to saying, this is an area I don't care about. Uh, if you have any interest at all in this, please come in and be a sub maintainer. And quite often this was not explicitly said as such, but it was, I mean, I was actively encouraging people to take over areas that I, I'm not interested in. And uh, nobody has time, and nobody has time, especially for long periods of time, of being there 24 seven for your developers. That is not what I'm claiming you, uh, you as a maintainer should do at all, because that's, you just burn out in, in weeks. So uh, my solution has always been to know what I care about, make sure I do concentrate on that part and find people and, and give them rope when there are areas that I don't care about. Uh, so when you're a main, sub maintainer for the kernel and you send me uh, a pull request and I trust you, I will not look at your code because by definition, it's not my job, it's your job. Uh, what happens and what people sometimes react to is when I get a pull request and I have uh, during the merge window and I start complaining about some minute detail in that pull request and 
people sometimes think it's because I look at everything. No, it's because that maintainer sent me something that I was thinking, that maintainer should not have touched that file. Why is he touching that file? He does not own that code. And then I start looking. Uh, and, and that's when I start also saying, I'm not going to pull you from you because you should not have touched that file. And when you did touch that file, I found a glaring error from just scanning your patches. And, and at that point, I'll go, yep, no, not going to happen. Uh, so there's two sides to this. One is give maintainers, sub-maintainers, the, the rope to hang themselves. You are not supposed to micromanage them. We call it empowering, by the way. Oh, empowering. Is that the, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the business yeah. term for yeah. give them rope? Yeah. Uh, but the other part is you need to also keep track of who owns what. And if people start doing odd things, you need to react to it and then look at it. And, and it's worked very well for the kernel, I think. Uh, obviously, uh, the teaching you should take away from this is once you get me to trust you, you can do anything as long as you stay in your own area. And it's true. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is why the kernel maintainership works. Because I will, I mean, when, when you're a Greg or a Hartman, when you're a David Miller, you can send me stuff and I will not micromanage you unless you start going crazy. So, and that's the only way to scale when you have a project with thousands of developers involved every single release. I, I love you, how you avoided talking about your photography skills. Oh. But I, I, I implied, right? I implied some things I don't care about. It turns out I suck as a photographer and I'm okay with that because I don't care. <laughs> and, and, and now I'll try to do the hard thing. Now I'll try to make sense of all of these questions that I've asked you which clearly surprised you earlier. So if I look at the way software is being built today, if I look at the, the insane complexity of many of these frameworks, if I look at the fact that, as you said, there are parts that you cannot possibly care about because you don't have the time, you being anybody. anybody. And, and how this becomes a more and more indirect, more and more layered, more and more complex world. Aren't you afraid that we are, we are dealing with a technology that we no longer understand, that we aren't trained to, to have a top to bottom view? You have told me many times that one of the things that attracted you to the kernel was that you loved the interaction with the hardware and knowing how things work. But then when I take a step back today and I use a typical application, whether it's on my phone or on a computer, there are so many layers, so many components that no one knows how all this works. And so what is your thought on that, on this, on this explosion of complexity? So, I mean, this is why I actually don't worry about technical issues in the kernel so much. I mean, I, I, that may be phrasing, misphrasing it. I, I worry about them, but I'm not worried about them in the long term. Uh, because what I really worry about tends to be uh, the flow of patches. So the workflow to me is actually way more important than the code. Uh, if you have the right workflow, the code will sort itself out. You, if, if a bug happens, you know how to deal with it. Uh, and, uh, and this is actually why I think open source, I mean, I've always been a proponent of open source, obviously. But I think this is also why open source is so fundamentally the right model of doing software development is because when you have complexities like this, you cannot manage it in, in a closed environment. You really can't. It's, uh, you need to have the people who actually find the problems. You need to give them the ability if they have the possibility to get involved and, and help you fix them. Because it is a complicated world. And when you're doing a complex project, and the kernel certainly counts, but it's not the only one, uh, the, 
the only way to deal with complexity is, is by having that open exchange of ideas and having the code out there so that people can participate. So let's try again for a perfect Linux soundbite, something that fits into a tweet. So do you still understand the Linux kernel? No, no, no. <laughs> but there, are, there are certain areas that if you send me a patch, you should react, expect way more reaction. There's the, the one area I've cared about pretty much since the beginning was the, the virtual file system layer. That's the only area I think in the kernel where I am still very active so that I will actually look at all, pretty much all of the core patches. Uh, certain parts of the x86 architecture stuff I will also follow. But when you have a project that, I how many? the scheduler is also something that you tend to. I don't worry about the scheduler anymore that I used to. Uh, but it, there's 30 plus thousand files in however many 10 million lines of code that nobody knows the whole kernel. Uh, the the one, one thing I have is having looked at patches for a long, many, many years, and uh, I know the kind of big picture of pretty much all the areas in the kernel. So I can look at a patch and I can often tell whether it's right or wrong, even if I don't know that area in intimate detail. And I then obviously know who to blame and who to approach when things really go bad. And I say, hey, this is, here's a bug report. I know it's yours. Go off and fix it for me because I can't. Yeah, this is everyone's favorite Git command. Git blame. Damn, it's my code. <laughs> um, so what worries you about the future then? If, if you think that everything is going well and we, we, it's fine that things get more complex, are there things that you say, oh, this, this, this is a problem? Um, I still worry a bit about our maintainership. I have no reason to worry about our maintainership. We've, we've been doing really well and, and we, have, we have new people show up all the time and we have old people who still love what doing what they're doing, so they're still sticking around, and it's not because I hold a gun to their head, I promise. Uh, so, so we're doing everything right, and we haven't really had any issues, but at the same time, that is the one area where I'm uh, sometimes looking at key people and saying, oh, that would be really, really painful if he got hit by a bus. The, the question, I used to get the question, like, what happens if Linus is hit by a bus? And nobody really cares anymore because there's always a maintainer for whatever subsystem. We're, we got that covered. But there's a few subsystems where, where you have a bus factor that is pretty low. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there are a few people who I think are uh, somewhat overworked. Uh, and that, that worries me a bit. Why are you bitching about Greg? I expressly didn't want to mention Oh, sorry, him. sorry, <laughs> I misunderstood. Um, so, so the last time we were in Vancouver, uh, I'm sure you remember. No. <laughs> the, the last time we were in Vancouver, I'm sure you remember, we were driving up here, we did our uh, dive master training. Yeah, yeah. That's and a long time. This was 2011, and we had the 20 years. I've been here of, since, though. Yeah, well, but for, for the Linux event, I mean, come on, help me out here. Um, so we had the 20 years of Linux celebration up here in Vancouver, and it was awesome. And so I was thinking as the, as the closing question for our conversation, uh, how about we, we cause problems for the Linux Foundation? Make, make Angela really mad at us and, and create that perfect way to get off the stage. So where would you like to have the 30 years of Linux celebration? Because that's coming up, 2021. I mean, she, she already booked the 2020 conferences. So if you want to get ahead of the 2021 scheduling, now is your chance, Linus. No, no, people are clearly, they, they know how I work. So for, I think for 25 years, uh, it may have been Angela, maybe it was Jim who had the great idea to, to do it in Helsinki because the birthplace of Linux. And I was like, 
no, let's do it in Hawaii. <laughs> and uh, that didn't work. Uh, I don't remember where we actually did it. I think it was Germany somewhere. Uh, Prague? Yeah. yeah. Um, not Germany. Just making sure you know I'm not that <laughs> confused. Uh, but I, I don't think it's so much about the location, but somewhere warm and scuba divey would be good. On, on that happy note, yes. thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Yeah. And look at that. Yeah. <laughs>